Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's devotional. Our thought today is going to come from an article that was posted today. Uh, it says, Missouri pastor apologizes after berating cheap congregation for not buying him a designer watch. Uh, we're not going to read the whole article, but uh, there's something. There, there's two, two main points in here I want to bring out. A Missouri pastor has apologized, Missouri pastor has apologized after a viral video during a sermon earlier this month showed him scolding his congregation, telling him that they were poor and cheap for not buying him a luxury watch. Um, this part, he's basically, he's apologized. This is what he says that, you know, there, it, there was a context behind what he said, but that doesn't mean anything. The viral clip that circulated online showed uh, this individual scold churchgoers for not honoring him with a Movado watch he claimed to have asked for. Uh, now this is some of the stuff that he said in this video. He says, this is how I know you're still poor, broke, busted, and disgusted because of how you've been honoring me. Uh, I'm not worth your McDonald's money. I'm not worth your Red Lobster money. I'm not worth your uh, St. John Knits. Um, I ain't ain't worth y'all's Louis Vuitton, uh, Prada, Gucci, he says, goes on to call out his congregation or call his congregation cheap for not getting him the watch, which he says they can buy at Sam's Club. Uh, he says that, uh, you know, I asked for one last year. Here it is in August and he still hasn't gotten it. Um, so this is kind of some of the stuff he's, he's saying. Clip ends with the pastor saying, uh, y'all hear from your pastor and father. I'm over y'all. I'm over y'all cheap expressions. In the apology video, this fellow said that his actions and words were inexcusable and that he deeply regrets the moment. All right. So there's two components to this that I want to break down. First of all, obviously when the world uses the term pastor, uh, it's used in a way generally to describe an evangelist. Now, unfortunately, uh, that in the world that has also come to represent the leader of a church. Uh, in fact, even the article, he's scolding his congregation. Uh, and part of this mindset that this individual seems to have is the fact that he should be honored as being the leader that would seem to be kind of the implication that they haven't been honoring him properly. Uh, and he says, y'all hear from your pastor and father. Uh, as if he's, I, I'm assuming he's using that phrase father in almost like a priestly sense. Like a, a um, almost Catholic church way, father. Uh, certainly uh, these terms and, and just the mindset overall, uh, we talk about the organization of the church and how the church is to be established. Obviously, an evangelist is not to be the leader of a church, nor is there to be one man over an entire church, over in the sense of overseeing, having authority over, or anything like that. Christ is the head of the church, Colossians 1. But then he established elders, a plurality of at least two, uh, to be have to have authority and to be in charge, to rule over. The, the New Testament uses the phrase to rule over or to rule well, uh, a local congregation. And an evangelist isn't supposed to have, as an evangelist, that type of authority or that type of leadership. Now, unfortunately, sometimes, obviously in the religious world, that's what the, this is what you get. Evangelists call themselves pastors. They call themselves, in this case, father, which again, that, that expression in and of itself carries the connotation of, of authority and lead the leader. But I want to bring out uh, two points about this that uh, I think are important to to remember. Oh, uh, no, wrong one. There we go. So, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 
and starting in verse, well, start in verse 3. Uh, so in the New Testament, the ter there's a phrase, filthy lucre, that comes up regularly. When I say regularly, it comes up five times uh, in the original King James. Uh, now, most of these are the same term, and the two that aren't are directly related terms. Uh, but it's interesting because in all except for one of those cases, the concept of filthy lucre is associated with elders. In First Timothy chapter 3, here in verse 3, a bishop, and of course talking about qualifications of an elder, uh, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, uh, and then verse 3, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. And this phrase, verse 3, not greedy for money, it's translated filthy lucre or not greedy of filthy lucre in the King James. But the term means uh, that which is sordid gain. And it's not necessarily specifically to how an individual gains those funds. It's the motivation behind which he gains those funds. The motivation of greed is what makes the lucre filthy. And so that's the, the, the concept here. And certainly uh, having dishonest or illegal means of gaining money certainly would be a part of that because greed in those cases would still be the motivation. Uh, but in 1 Timothy 3 verse 8, this is the one time where it's not used in relation to an elder. In this case, it's a deacon. Uh, and they must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money. The exact same term that Paul uses earlier in verse 3. In Titus chapter 1 and in verse 7, a bishop must be blameless, uh, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. Again, same term. Titus chapter 1 verse 7, Paul tells Titus to set those things that are lacking, set in order those things that are lacking. Um, he must be, uh, this is, oh, I'm sorry, verse 11. And so verse 11 continues going on talking about uh, the qualifications of an elder, characteristics of an elder. He says, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole household, teaching things which they ought not, for the sake of filthy lucre or dishonest gain. And so in this one verse, uh, and, and again, I guess technically two verses because one is about a deacon, no, but this one verse is the only time where it's not associated with uh, elders. And, and like I said, First uh, Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 8 about deacons. But this is individuals who the elders must be proactive in defending a congregation against those who are insubordinate and idle talkers and deceivers. They're standing up, they're speaking things that they ought not. They try to subvert individuals to following after them. They teach things that they shouldn't, all for the sake of filthy lucre. And then First Peter 5 and verse 2 is the other one. Uh, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And I say all of that to say this. The term for a pastor is an elder. Okay, that's the, we talk about an elder, a pastor, or a bishop. Those are all descriptive terms of the same office, the office of an elder. Not necessarily specifically an evangelist. Now, can an evangelist also be an elder? Yes, he can. Uh, and can elders often be an evangelist? Sure, they can. But an evangelist does not equate to a pastor. And certainly not even elders, not should there not be one ruling or, or overseeing a, a whole congregation by themselves. That being the case, certainly as men who may seek to desire to be an elder one day, this is kind of a warning uh, to that extent not only from the perspective of making sure our motivations are pure, fellas, but also to recognize for ourselves and for you know, those who are part of the religious world who may be confused about this concept, to be able to define the difference between a 
pastor and an evangelist. First of all, this if this man quote is quote unquote a pastor elder, he shouldn't be serving as one for, for one thing. Uh, and if he's an evangelist and yet he's the leader, he shouldn't be calling himself a pastor. That's not even to take into account what may or may not be taught at this congregation or how they worship or anything else. But the other aspect to this that I want to bring out as well is that in general, when it comes to our motivation and our uh, thought process regarding money, remember what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 to Timothy. Uh, he says, if anyone teaches otherwise, does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrine that accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing. Uh, he goes on to say that uh, these individuals, they give themselves to arguments and, and they from which come strife and envy, reviling, useless wranglings. They suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourself. And I think that that's a very interesting phrase. And of course, certainly there are, I'm sure there are specific examples and issues Paul has in mind when he's writing this to Timothy. But that's a very, that's a kind of a broad thought process. He's not just talking about false teachers and individuals who are seeking to draw people after themselves. He also addresses the motivation of these individuals. They suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Now this term gain here isn't specific to uh, money necessarily. Uh, however, the term carries with it the sense of, of advantage. Okay, so it could be any type of advantage, whether that's influence, power, money, certainly, something that I can gain from my efforts a means of, of putting myself in a better, a better situation, putting myself in an advantage. And Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. But then immediately in verse 7 and 8, he starts talking about the love of money. And so certainly part of what Paul has in mind here involves monetary or at least material gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. I think it's important for us to remember, in addition to distinguishing the difference between a pastor or an elder and an evangelist, as uh, the world, the religious world has a problem with that, is also to address the, the nature of our motivation, our purpose. Uh, this fellow in the article seemed to equate the concept of honoring with giving him things or giving him money. And certainly in the New Testament, this, the idea of worthy of double honor, for instance, the first Timothy five regarding the elders, that does include the concept of supporting them or paying them as they are putting their effort into uh, overseeing a congregation of the Lord's people. But in this particular concept, he's associating how he perceives people honoring him by what they're willing to give him. And that to me speaks directly to what Paul's describing here, that they see, uh, Paul warns about individuals who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. And of course, in this case, godliness being a, 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 a an outward perception of godliness, perhaps, is being utilized, an image of, percept of godliness is being utilized to prop oneself up to receive material honor, to receive material gain. And then he is determining, uh, judging that that honor, that material gain, is not enough. 
And at no point is that something that elders, first of all, are to determine, well, you know what, you're not honoring me enough. Uh, but second of all, uh, certainly speaking to the concept of our motivation to make sure that we aren't thinking about material gain in that way. You know, Paul says that food and clothing, with these we shall be content. In other words, we should be able to be content with even the basic necessities of life. For that matter, Paul says in Philippians 4, there were times where he even suffered need. He went hungry, and yet he had learned to be content in whatever state he was in. And so even at times maybe where we don't even have food or clothing, which in our society, generally speaking, not always true, but generally speaking, we usually have at least the basic necessities. Uh, with these, we shall be content. Which is what goes to show that what our mind needs to be on. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Remember what the term godliness means. It means seeking to please God, the desire to please God. And if I seek to please God and desire to please God, then my mind is not going to be filled with seeking to be rich and seeking to have possessions and uh, having a love of money and trying to gain more and more, either through monetary gain or power or influence or anything else. My mind's on pleasing God and whatever responsibilities are involved in that, I need to make sure I take care of. And it, it just kind of stands in contrast. I'm not, I'm not, and I, I'm going to be clear, I'm not trying to pick on this, this fella here. I just, I found it interesting and I'm sure that this is a, a another example that will be used and brought up uh, by many people who may be atheists or maybe religious but are, are maybe spiritual but aren't religious who are against organized religion as another example of uh, hypocrite and uh, basically organized religion is a means of trying to to uh, manipulate and try to get something out of it and so forth and perhaps in this case they may be accurate on this one I, again i don't know this fellow and i don't know uh, he says there's a context in which he was saying this i i can't imagine what context would and, and he doesn't even suggest that the context justifies it either but uh, the point is that i think it's very important that we kind of set back and remember first of all for ourselves what our purpose needs to be that it's not set towards uh, greed for accumulation of things that we aren't putting our trust in uncertain riches as Paul will go on to say there in verse 76 but also uh, that those who are in leadership roles uh, primarily elders okay certainly that they do not have a mindset or an attitude of seeking what can I gain uh, but sometimes evangelists can take advantage of their situation, of their position, especially in the absence of elders, uh, that evangelists don't take advantage of that situation either. Uh, and it all goes back to certainly the individual intent, the individual uh, goal or the, the desire, but also goes to being a proper example. I mean, this is one of those things, obviously this is in the Church of Christ, uh, and even if it was, uh, and there was one man over it, whether he was an elder or an evangelist, I would suggest it wasn't a true church of Christ, church that belongs to Christ. But regardless, this is the type of thing that can bring reproach upon organized religion at the very least. And we have to be very careful of the mindset that we demonstrate to others, what our goal is, what our priorities are and make sure that we show that our priority is godliness with contentment. That's our priority. And everything else is whatever it is. It's it's going to be, you know, I, I, does that mean I, I can't take thought for getting a promotion or getting a better job? No, that's not what that, that means. But it does mean that my priority is still going to be to serve God first and not to allow that motivation of, of desire for more money and more stuff or influence or power to be a part of that. All right, that's the devotional for you today. 
Uh, Lord willing, our next devotion will be tomorrow at 6.30. I hope to see you all then. Thank you, everybody.